All right, how about we do this? Hello! <laughs> Welcome to Archival Adventures! Happy Wednesday, and I hope that you're having a great week this week. Uh, I am Anthony Wright de Hernandez, Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech, and also known on the internet, especially on the Twitchy, Twitch, Twitcherverse, as Rogan27. <clears throat> I'm streaming out live to you from uh, Newman Library here on the campus of Virginia Tech uh, for my regular Archival Adventures program where we look at materials from Special Collections and University Archives here at the University. And this is going out to two uh, Twitch channels currently, uh, twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios, which is the library's Twitch channel, as well as my own personal channel, twitch.tv slash Rogan27. Uh, so, uh, hello to everybody that I see in the chat. Um, Fluidan, it's great to see you. Sterling, I hope that you are feeling okay. Please do not um, overstress. Also, it's good to see you. Um, T squared, <laughs> hello and welcome. Um, <clears throat> I know, a Rogan and a stream. I know, it's weird because it doesn't feel like Wednesday, but it's Wednesday. Uh, Simsilica, hi. Oh, and um, whoever tossed the shout out in on my channel for the VTUL Studios channel, thank you very, very much. Um, yeah, if you want to give a follow over to VTUL Studios, that would be awesome. What is that? <laughs> Hi, Lord Portico. I have no idea where those fireworks came from. Because Zoom is not on. Like, I don't have Zoom open. So is that OBS that did that? Because I don't know what settings those are, but apparently this equal that and I don't know where it's coming from <laughs> who knows but yay I have no idea I, I, I will I will investigate that but I do not know where that came from Like, I knew Zoom had implemented that stuff, but Zoom is not open on this computer. Uh, maybe one of the more recent Apple, like, Mac operating system updates implemented that? Or OBS Studio on the Mac has that? I don't know. That'll be something to investigate. Um, it's fun. I, I'm not opposed to it. I just wish I knew where it was coming from. Anywho. Um, <laughs> uh, since we are going to be looking at historical materials today, uh, specifically historical materials related to globalization, economics, and resource management... Today's a particularly good day for us to remember the history of the institution uh, that I am currently at. <laughs> Hi, Hannah. <clears throat> Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that the Morrill Land Grant College Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tutelo, uh, Tutelo and Monacan peoples, 
and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. Virginia Tech acknowledges that its Blacksburg campus sits partly on land that was previously the site of the Smithfield and Solitude Plantations, owned by members of the Preston family. Between the 1770s and the 1860s, the Prestons and other local white families that owned parcels of what became Virginia Tech also owned hundreds of enslaved people. We acknowledge that enslaved black people generated wealth that financed the predecessor institution to Virginia Tech, the Preston and Olin Institute, and they also worked on construction of its building. Not until 1953, however, was the first black student permitted to enroll. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to prosim that I may serve, in the spirit of community diversity and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. <clears throat> okay. So, what do I mean by globalization and economics and resource distribution? Today, we are going to be looking at uh, some of the work of R. Buckminster Fuller, um, <clears throat> specifically, uh, we're going to be, like, our, our primary focus will be the Dan Fusaro collection on R. Buckminster Fuller, um, with some items from the R. Buckminster Fuller collection two separate collections, both focused on Buckminster Fuller. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, apparently not everybody in the world knows who Buckminster Fuller is, so we'll get to that. And our particular focus today is something called the World Game, uh, which I was not previously familiar with. <clears throat> so we're going to learn about that today. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of excited. Uh, we are going to attempt to solve all of humanity's problems by looking at what people did to theoretically solve all of humanity's problems. Uh, <laughs> so, um, I, there is not a published finding aid presently for the Dan Fusaro collection. It's very new. We just got it. Not to be confused with the color spinner for Twister, which is a world game. <laughs> Rogan solves the world. Oh dear. So much pressure. Um, so there is not a published finding aid yet. So what you see on your screen right now behind me is our internal database where the finding aid is in the process of being created, but it has not been published yet. So you're getting a sneak preview. Um, so I'm going to jump straight to the notes, or directly to the notes, as as uh, the case may be. Um, the abstract is a good place to start. Let's see. This collection contains material related to the life and accomplishments of R. Buckminster Fuller. It consists of items collected by Dan, Don uh, Fusaro. Is it Don? Well, I think I've said and typed Dan many times. It's Dawn, apparently, and... Yeah. My apologies for getting it wrong. Um, who was a fan of Fuller's work and a remote volunteer for the World Game Project. Um, there should be a historical note in here, which is also going to be helpful if I can find it. I mean, I can definitely find it if it's been written. Biographical note. <clears throat> Poor Dan being used as, as a mistake. I Well, yes, if there is a Dan Fusaro, my apologies to you as well. Um, but yeah, hi, Detective Zen. Um, Donald... Don Fusaro was a computer systems analyst with the Library of Congress from 1970 until his retirement in 1998. He held a master's degree from Yale University. Fusaro was a fan of R. Buckminster Fuller and worked as a remote volunteer for Fuller's World Game Project in the 1970s. Fusaro eventually began corresponding with Fuller himself. 
He died in 2009 at the age of 81. Uh, so we will be looking at his materials, which um, I think probably go more broad than just the world game, but we're going to focus on the world game. Um, <clears throat> so for anybody who does not know, I should probably also uh, go over who the heck is our Buckminster Fuller? <laughs> Which I was surprised to discover not everybody in the world knows. Um, our Buckminster Fuller, which whenever there's an initialism like this and in it uh, whenever somebody just goes by the initial uh i always have to look and see what the actual name is because they're not like by putting the initial in there they're letting you know hey this is part of my name they're letting you know they're that something is there um which is not the same as i don't use this name it's just that his primary name was his middle name, not his given name. Buckminster Fuller is a quite memorable name. Um, so the R stands for Richard. Uh, but uh, R. Buckminster Fuller was born in Milton, Massachusetts on July 12, 1895. He attended Harvard University from 1913 to 1915, but never finished his degree. He attended the U.S. Naval Academy in 1917 and served as an officer in the United States Navy during World War I. In 1954, Fuller patented the geodesic dome, the structure he is most famous for as an architect. The U.S. Pavilion, a geodesic dome, designed by Fuller was a main feature of the Canadian Universal and International Exposition, or sorry, Exhibition in 1967. They interchange exhibition and exposition, exposition and, yes, expo and exhibition get interchanged a lot in the names of those things. And so my apologies for stumbling. But anyway, in 1967, the U.S. Pavilion was a geodesic dome uh, designed by Fuller at the Canadian Universal and International Exhibition. Uh, Fuller was also the inventor of a Dymaxion car as well as a Dymaxion world map, a map which limited the distortions that are common with most world maps, and that will have relevance for us looking into the world game today. Um, the Mercator projection and the distortions that it introduces into perception. Um, Fuller was not just an inventor and architect, but a philosopher and poet. He published many books and articles throughout his life, both fiction and nonfiction. Fuller's contributions as a poet, philosopher, architect, and inventor have made him the subject of numerous books and articles, as well as earning him many honorary degrees and awards. Uh, most of the collection that we have um, is correspondence written by Fuller, uh, as well as letters written to him from various sources, um, a lot of its unsigned copies of letters to and from him, uh, a lot of it is photocopies of articles from uh, magazines, etc. Um, and most of it is from his time working at the University of Minnesota. Um, I, I don't actually know why we have this this material um let me see if there's a source of acquisition note we bought it probably because it's materials related to an architect but uh it says it was purchased for the architectural collection uh sometime around 1975 which means that it would have been up at public auction because um, otherwise, this stuff would, would have made a lot more sense uh, to be part of collections at the University of Minnesota, where he had been a faculty member. But we do have a well-known architecture program here, so having material from an architect as famous as Buckminster Fuller um, makes sense. Um, 
So just in case you do not know what a geodesic dome looks like. Oh, lovely. Sorry, I, this is not a browser that I ever use. So the fact that there are ads on it and sponsored links is because I never use it. But the other browser didn't let me access the site I needed because the internet is frustrating. Um, the security certificate on our URL for accessing our internal database uh, expired and <clears throat> my browser wouldn't let me open the page. So I had to use a different browser that I could bypass the security on. Um, that I was like, yes, I want to open the page anyway. <laughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> this is a geodet geodesic dome. Probably the most famous one, the one you're likely to have seen before, is this one, which is uh, Spaceship Earth at Epcot Center in uh, Florida, part of Disney World. Um, but so that shape, the structure of that shape was discovered slash invented slash I don't actually know if he was the first but he was the one that patented it uh, <laughs> so Buckminster Fuller is famous for the um, geodesic dome and there are various pictures this is the Wikipedia page you're welcome to go there and explore those images yourself. What we're going to focus on today is another thing he worked on that he is much less famous for. But, yes, it is the buckyball. It's also called a buckyball. That is true. Um, I, I say less famous for the world game, but still well known for the world game. Like, it, it's not an unknown thing. It's just something that I think is less well-known than the, than the buckyball or the geodesic dome. So this is my, my guide to the highlights uh, as prepared by um, my student assistant, uh, Sterling. So it uh, looks like at least one item in each of the boxes that seemed particularly interesting and I additionally pulled one box of the Buckminster Fuller collection that I marked a couple of things um, as relevant so let me start with box one or no let's start with box three um Box three, the highlight was flyers, uh, and flyers seem like a good space to start. Um, but also, this is a nice little plaque in memory of a synergist, Donald Fusaro, 1927 to 2009, the Synergistics Collaborative, June 2010. Um, so I just, that was, oh, and just because I just saw the Transcription, April 7th, 1975, Synergetics. To Donald Fissaro, whose path of experience is closely akin to my own and has tended to generate the same great and exquisite questions for both of us and the discovery thereby of some of the eternal cosmic laws that govern our myriad of special case experiencing. In him, I find the most faithful of friends because faithful to truth as discovered by mind. Buckminster Fuller. All right. Um well, let's let's see what we got. I'm hoping a flyer will be a good space to start with a a good like overall primer. Hi Stephen Joyce, how are you today? Um Oh gosh, I'm so excited. I might be a fan of Buckminster Fuller. 
Um, it, it, if it wasn't obvious. Uh, okay, we've got a newspaper called Better News, it looks like. Um, I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know if anything in here is going to be interesting. I just thought I'd flip through it. That is if I can separate the pages. <laughs> I love the many excite emotes. Uh, honestly, I love all of the art and, and styling of your channel, Steven. I would copy it one to one, except that that would not be a good thing to do. <laughs> oh, I certainly borrow, I, I borrow elements, but yeah, I, I would never actually copy all of it one to one, but I, I would love like, I, I love all of it. So, um, yeah, this doesn't seem relevant to the world game topic. So I'm just going to put that aside and let's dig into these because it, it's the highlight said flyers. Um, these seem bigger than flyers, but. Ah, maybe this. <clears throat> it's a poster. An engaging and invigorating evening of theatrical mind candy. Chicago Tribune. R. Buckminster Fuller. The History and Mystery of the Universe. Written and directed by D.W. Jacobs. From the life, work, and writings of R. Buckminster Fuller. Uh, May 28th to July 4th, 2010 in Crystal City at Arena Stage. Arena Stage is... Arena Stage is a good stage i i've been there many times i know people who have worked there um arena stage does good productions it is it is one of the good theaters in dc or in the dc area world game workshop hey something on topic <laughs> um hang on one second i'm gonna move a couple of these out of the way. I feel really scattered at the moment, but I'm also just excited because I enjoy this topic. <clears throat> World Game Workshop. Uh, so you can, you get the overall, but I'm gonna zoom in for like actual reading purposes. Um ta -da, da -da -da. There. The Earth is presently faced. Oh, presently. I, I now have to look and see 1975. Uh needed to know a date. Have the items in this collection gone through deacidification yet? Um no, SimSilica. Uh, we store things in acid-free boxes and folders and such, but typically we don't end up uh, putting them through that sort of uh, preservation because uh, doing deacidification, um, we don't have the facilities to do it ourselves. We would have to send it off-site. It costs money. And... Um, Unless they're getting frequent use, it doesn't, it, it isn't super necessary if they're stored in good conditions. Um, and so, yes, if there's particularly acidic paper, it will deteriorate over time. Um, most of this stuff is from the mid 70s. So it's probably not too bad. And it's not, uh, unless there's newsprint, which there is some newsprint. Um, most of this is like printer paper from the 70s, uh, which isn't going to be terrible as far as um, 
what it is. If there was something particularly unique that needed that sort of preservation, we could send it off and have that done. Um, but yeah, no, uh, we that's not part of our standard process when we're dealing with collections. Um, yeah, I was I was thinking I was gonna say also doing any sort of chemical processes to the paper like deacidification. While it's done for preservation purposes and probably will benefit for the long term, um, any sort of processing like that can also introduce an opportunity for damage. Uh, so I'm, that's probably another reason why we don't automatically do it. Um, <clears throat> but as far as I'm aware, we've not really done any since I started working here. We haven't really had anything uh, that was in such a state that it needed to be done. All right, so 1975. The Earth is presently faced with an accelerating frequency of crises. Reserves of many of our critical resources are dwindling, and the Earth's biosphere cannot continue to safely absorb the exponential growth of our wastes. Nearly half of humanity still lives with only minimum levels of life support, and our present locally focused methods of planning are inadequate for solving global problems. The purpose of this international multidisciplinary workshop is to furnish participants with a working understanding of what Buckminster Fuller calls comprehensive anticipatory design science, the application of the principles of science to the conscious design of our environment. Design science involves exploring and developing increasingly more effective ways to gain the greatest possible performance from the least investment of resources. It involves understanding the interrelated nature of our problems and alternative approaches for recognizing, resolving, and anticipating them. Uh, <clears throat> so in the first week of this World Game Workshop, uh, they had orientation, pro it's an, it was an orientation program in the first week, lectures, films, videotapes, slides, games, and discussions to introduce the basic principles of design science and the world game. So basic understanding of what is design science and how does the world game function. Um, material covered will include global perspectives on humanity's problems, general systems theory and its applications to global problem solving, environmental planning, world resource management, global energy development, and futures studies. Uh, lecturers for the first week included Buckminster Fuller himself. Uh, the world game employs design science to produce progressively higher performance per units of invested time, energy, and know-how per each and every component function of the world's resources to provide for all of humanity. Uh, other speakers in the first week, <clears throat> Nicholas uh, Georgescu uh, Reagan, Nicholas Georgescu Reagan, uh, entropy law and the economic process. With a lifespan amounting to no more than a blink of a galaxy and restricted within a speck of space, mankind is in the same situation as a pupa designed never to witness a caterpillar crawling or a butterfly flying. The difference, however, is that the human mind wonders what is beyond mankind's chrysalis? What happened in the past and especially what will happen in the future? Uh, Russell Ackoff, Redesigning the Future, Comprehensive, Coordinated, and Integrated Planning, not Isolated Problem Solving, is required if we are to bring about significant environmental improvements. Irvin Laszlo, A Strategy for the Future and the World System, 
<clears throat> Given our needs as well as our capabilities, if we can envisage a desirable and realistically attainable world order, we can devise strategies for achieving it. Uh, Gene Youngblood, expanded cinema and the video sphere. If there is any revolution in consciousness, it has to do with a fundamental reevaluation of what it is to be a human being. Uh, Edwin Schlossberg, Projects and Einstein Beckett. The fact that we can see problems is the first step towards their dissolution. The future does not ask for one plan, but the most various assortments that can be considered. Howard Odom, via videotape, will be lecturing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> environment, power, and society. The true value of energy to society is the net energy, which is that after the energy costs of getting and concentrating that energy are subtracted, Worldwide inflation is driven in part by the increasing fraction of our fossil fuels that have to be used in getting more fossil fuels and other fuels. Uh, and the staff of Earth Metabolic Design. And then weeks two through four, uh, design science applications. Uh, this part of the workshop will allow participants to gain a practical working experience in design science by utilizing the philosophy, methods, and procedures presented in week one. Groups will develop viable alternatives for resolving critical global problems. I, I love that there is a typo in there. And that it, the typo is in the word problems. Uh, this year, uh, or this year's work will include a global food development strategy. Global communications development, directed by Gene Youngblood, designs for increasing the efficiencies in energy utilization patterns and planning for the economy in transition. The 1975 workshop will be held from June 21st to July 18 at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, United States of America. Participants may register for the week one program for the week one program of orientation only or for the complete four week program of orientation and the design science applications. It was $350 for the full four week workshop or $150 for just the orientation week. Um, yeah. I, I'm. This is something that I would enjoy doing. Um, it would be above my head, but I would be, I would have so much fun learning. Uh, this is 100% the type of um, problem solving philosophy that um, Kim Stanley Robinson employed or, or, or it's in a lot of his novels. Um, specifically the Mars Trilogy, uh, it's this sort of globalist approach to problem solving. Um, and I think that's possibly where I was sort of introduced to a, a sort of philosophical thought of this nature was through Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars Trilogy. Um, but... It, it's it's interesting. I, I I enjoy it. It seems really interesting to me. So July 4th, 1976, Design Revolution, Buckminster Fuller's keynote, Bicentennial Address at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, so and a poster. It's a it's a very tall poster. It's um, eight and a half by twenty two, I think. Uh, so hard to hard to grab on camera, but. Uh, um, and not specifically about the world game, which I do want to keep as a focus. Um, <clears throat> one second. All right, we've got a 
chart. Oh, I know what these are. I love that these are in here. This is this is what I flagged in the Buckminster Fuller collection uh, to for us to be sure that we looked at there. Um, so the fact that they're in the Fasaro collection, um, like I I don't even have to. They're easier to get to here. Um, uh, and you'll see what they are soon. I, they're big. So it's going to take me a moment. Um, so uh, is anybody familiar with the Model United Nations? Model UN? Because to me, this seems like the same sort of thought experiment as the Model UN, but for um, resource distribution instead of politics. Like, they seem really similar to me. <clears throat> so we've got World Food System Data Sheet. Um, World Food System Data Sheet is compiled by the World Resources Inventory Division of the World Game. Uh, World, the World Resources Inventory gratefully acknowledges the generous assistance and cooperation given by the Population Reference Bureau Incorporated of Washington, D.C. and the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations in the preparation of this data sheet. All population figures, with the minor exception of agricultural population, are from the Population Reference Bureau 1979 World Population Data Sheet. All maps and other data compilations are from the are from um, Hoping Food for Everyone by Medard Gable, Double Bay, 1979. The World Resources Inventory is engaged in the collection, analysis, mapping, and dissemination of the vital statistics of planet Earth. The World Game is an innovative global planning tool engaged in the development of strategies for making the world work for 100% of humanity. It is an ongoing research and development activity devoted to the discovery of how to most efficiently and expeditiously employ the world's resources, technology, and know-how to the ever-advancing equal advantage of all humanity. It is an apolitical, non-profit, tax-exempt research, education, and planning organization supported by its educational events, foundation grants, individual and corporate contributions, and sale of publications. So that is sort of the first description of what is the world game that we've come across. Data what? Oh, data sheet. Detective Zen. Um, I mean, can't we just play Monopoly? It's simpler and has a winner. Monopoly is a game that was specifically designed to illustrate why capitalism is bad. <laughs> it, it, um, see, now I have to cite my sources, and I can't remember where... My nefarious plan to get that social commentary out worked. Um, uh, yeah. Okay, here's a good... Question is, where is? Aha! <laughs> uh, this is um, this is an article uh, on theconversation.com, um, but it so it it 
the conversation has a bias for sure, but uh, I believe I believe that it includes information about where they got the information. Um, if you take a look at it and it's not a super great resource, let me know and I'll find you a better one. But um, but yeah, uh, Monopoly was designed 100 years ago to teach the dangers of capitalism um, is the, the title of that article uh, from the conversation. Um, and it is written by Joel Abrams, it looks like. Um, so have fun with that. <laughs> if, if you did not realize that um, this most popular of games, Monopoly, was not intended to be a good time for families, and that's why you get in arguments with your family members when they play it by the rules. Because uh, it wasn't meant to have everybody get along and have fun. It was meant to teach. Okay, so we've got down one side a list of countries, and across the top, um, the data points, and then it's a chart of numbers. So um, if we look here, and we'll just say, uh, I don't know, we'll take Equatorial Guinea, um, which you're not going to be able to see. It's too tiny on your screen, probably. Ironic that it became a major product of capitalism. Yes, Detective Zen. <laughs> there is a great deal of irony in the history of Monopoly as a consumer product. Um, so Equatorial Guinea, in 1979, uh, their population estimate as of mid-1979 in millions is 0 0.3. Uh, rate of natural increase annually, 2.3%. Uh, population projection forward to the year 2000 in millions, 0 0.5. Um, so half a million. Birth rate per 1000 as of 1976-77, 42. Uh, death rate per 1,000 as of 1976-77, 19. Uh, and then we've got an infant, infant mortality rate, life expectancy at birth. Agricultural population, 249. Uh, agricultural population. Uh, what does that mean, I wonder? I don't know for certain. It tells me where it's from. It's from the FAO Production Yearbook, Volume 31, United Nations, uh, published in 1978. Um, if somebody does know what agricultural population means, um, that would be helpful. Uh, their gross national product was 340 in um, US dollars. 340? It doesn't say that that's in thousands or anything. So now I'm now I must check uh, to see if I can understand this number better. GDP or GNP, sorry. Um, per capita, oh per capita gross national product. That makes more sense. Three forty per capita. Uh, arable land. Uh, in thousand hectare, thousand hectare units is uh, two hundred thirty-two tractors in use. Ninety-five irrigated agricultural land uh, in thousands of hectares. None fertilizer consumption per hectare of arable land and permanent crops. Uh, Four hundred grams. Primary energy production in 1,000 metric ton coal equivalents, none. Per capita commercial energy consumption, coal equivalents in kilograms, 94. Total main roads, 
number of kilometers. Um, the number is directly on a fold. So I can't be 100% certain because uh, it is worn through at this spot, but I believe it is 1,000. Uh, total cereal production per or, or in 1,000 metric ton units, zero. Uh, total roots and tubers production in 1,000 metric tons units, 82. Total vegetable vegetables and melons production, none. Total fruit, excluding melons, production, 15,000 metric tons. Uh, total pulses production? I, I would need some definitions, which is, I assume, what the orientation would give you, because I don't know what pulses even means in this context. Um, uh, but... They produce no, produced none. Total meat, including poultry, none. Uh, total fish catch, 4,000 metric tons. Total calories per capita per day. Um, I don't know if it's none or they just don't have data, but it's a, it's a dash. Uh, total protein per capita per day, A dash, again. Total fat per capita per day. A dash, again. Um, crops production. I, no, I think this is, this is separate. This is separate. That's a different chart on the side. Anyway. Um, I don't know what the balloons are. Again, uh, if you were here at the start of the stream, something, there's some sort of system, and I don't know what it is, but something on my computer is putting reactions. And I don't know what is adding them, so I don't know where to turn it off. Um, I don't know, I, I don't even know what gesture makes the balloons happen. <laughs> Typical governmental response. The number is on a fold, so we couldn't read it. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, balloons happened last week also, and I forgot that they happened, and so I didn't look into it. I know Zoom has implemented that sort of like gestural recognition thing, but Zoom is not open on this computer at the moment, which makes me think that it is in some way the an update to the Apple operating system. Um, but I don't know for certain. Uh, it could be an OBS, but I feel like I would know about it if it was OBS. Um, Yeah, I know. It's a fun mystery, but like, so the, the thumbs up to get the fireworks, the double thumbs up for fireworks, that's implementing on my face camera. The balloons happened on the, the other camera. So it was some sort of gesture with my hands that made the balloons happen. But I don't know what it was. Anyway, uh, then we have the World Energy Data Sheet. Same thing, uh, that the one we just looked at was food. This is energy. Um, again, like if we went across, we could look at Equatorial Guinea. Um, and we've got population statistics, total arable land, total commercial energy production, total commercial energy consumption, commercial energy consumption per capita. Uh, etc. All sorts of like data points, breaking it down for basically every country in existence. Um, and so those are those charts 
are the inputs for the world game, as I understand it. Maybe the program is really excited about crop and food information. I mean, maybe. I assume it is some sort of AI implementation that I didn't really want and was added without me really knowing, um, and that I just need to find the setting that turns it off, um, which in the case of Apple, I'm pretty sure I can do. Um, were this Microsoft, I probably would have no choice and it would just be there and I wouldn't be able to get rid of it. Um, sorry. <laughs> That's how they have been implementing a lot of their features lately and I am not happy about it. Um, I, I otherwise like either one, but I don't like being forced to use programs that I don't want to use. All right, grand strategy of world problem solving demonstrated technical and economic uh, efficacy of individual initiative in the 20th century. Uh, let's parse that again. Grand strategy of world problem solving demonstrated technical and economic efficacy of individual initiative in the 20th century. Oh, wow. I don't know how to... I'm uncertain how to read this. Where's the balloons for that title? Exactly. Um, I'm going to zoom in because I want to read the what I am trying to do and I want the words to be, you know, so that you can follow along, maybe. Um... So this, what I am trying to do, is signed Buckminster Fuller at the end. And this is from 1974. Uh, the first world game, as far as I understand it, happened in 1970. Uh, so what I am trying to do, all excitedly acknowledging the a priori infinite mystery implicitly revealed as that which, though relevant, always remains undiscovered and unexplained and is popularly overlooked in the momentary excitement of preoccupation with that which is discovered and especially in realization of the new human advantaging significance of each great scientific discovery wherein, for instance, Isaac Newton discovers the rational geometrical rate of change characterizing the interattractiveness of any two celestial bodies, while their relative distances apart vary only at an arithmetical rate, which interattractiveness itself, let alone its inverse second power rate of gain, is not manifest in any of the physical characteristics of either of the celestial bodies, when either is considered only separately and only in terms of its integral dimensions, mass, chemistry, and independent electromagnetic properties, and which mathematically varying interattractiveness laws of Newton, though found thereafter by science to, always, to be always unfailingly operative in all macro and microcosmic structuring, as well as in the dynamic interpositioning of all the individually remote bodies of a complex movement, Newton's discovered law never explains why the interattractiveness of the remote from one another bodies occurs, nor does it even suggest what the invisible interattractiveness is, though it is so comprehensively important as apparently to guarantee the, ec the eternal integrity of the universe itself, and even though we give that unexplained behavior the name gravity, gravity like all scientific generalizing is inherently synergetic, which means the behavior of whole systems unpredicted by behaviors of any of the system's parts, considered only separately, wherefore it is a part of the great mystery, which always remains unexplained by such discoveries as Newton's, of the first power arithmetical versus the second power geometrical augmentation rates 
of constantly intercovarying gravitational interattractiveness of separate bodies in universe that to the best of our knowledge only human minds can discover these invisible relationships existing only between and not of any of the synergetics systems plurality of independently occurring constituents for brains always and only uh, apprehend differentially the separate definitively tuned in sep special case sensorial inputs and recalls which in themselves contain no clues to the synergetic behaviors of the omni intercommoditive uh, uh sorry uh, omni inter Omni inter interaccommodative of the omni interaccommodative mathematically generalized principles always demonstrably governing the complex the complexedly overlapping episodes of scenario universes non simultaneous multi frequenced and magnituded differentially covariance ever intertransforming aberrationally limited conflict complementations and energetic transactions and being also acutely aware of our own corporeal limitations yet ever renewably inspired by personal rediscoveries of the cosmic integrity permitting total utilization of our innate and consciously active uh, activable almost completely subconscious faculties employing them to search for conscious and orderly means of bringing about truth guided by human minds constructively competent participation in the strategic decisions governing its own evolutionary trending options and employing only the unique and limited advantages inhering exclusively to those individuals who take and maintain the economic initiative in the face of the formidable physical capital and credit advantages of the massive corporations foundations trade or other special interest unions and political states and deliberately avoiding political ties and tactics as well as all negative actions and reforms while endeavoring by experience and explorations to inductively excite all individual earthians awareness and realization of humanity's higher potentials i seek through comprehensively anticipatory design science and its reductions to physical practices in the forms of inanimate artifacts to reform the environment instead of trying to reform human behaviors and opinions, which latter is what all history's political powers have always done. For I am intent exclusively through artifact inventions to accomplish prototyped capabilities of doing ever more with ever less, whereby in turn the wealth augmenting prospects of such design regenerations will induce their spontaneous spontaneous and economically successful industrial proliferation by world around exclusively service oriented industries as the regeneratively escalating effectiveness of the latter's resource reinvestments per each unit of resources reinvested to render comprehensively obsolete any and all economic necessity to own anything while obsoleting as well the economically degenerative practices of selling off the world's resources, all of which chain reactions tend to ever higher performance attainments of the improving artifact service events will both permit and induce all humanity to realize full lasting economic and physical success plus enjoyment of all earth without one individual interfering with or being advantaged at the expense of another at each thenceforth to function in predominantly metaphysical ways in our cosmically designed role as the most effective local universe problem detector and solver in the vast complex reciprocal scheme of celestial energies increasingly disorderly and expanding local entropic export exportings and their elsewhere concomitant, increasingly orderly and contracting syntropic in importings, thus to fortify the total success of eternally regenerative universe for which unique local universe functioning, we humans were designedly born naked, ignorant, and helpless to learn for ourselves only through millions of years of trial and error experiences that our muscles and physical power are utterly subordinate to our minds, universe searching and inventing capabilities, and that we humans alone amongst all known organisms were given intellectual access to the family of exclusively mathematical metaphysical principles 
ever demonstrably governing the cosmic integrity of eternal regeneration, and because the meaning of design is that all the parts are purposely interarranged in respect to one another, and because all the generalized scientific principles are omni inter accommodative, that is, none ever contradict another, they constitute a design to which human mind has the only known access other than that of the comprehensive intellectual integrity of the universe itself. Buckminster Fuller, August 4, 1974, Bear Island, Maine. I'm gonna take a drink now. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't this the principles of all rom-coms? Uh, in which we learned that our Buckminster Fuller never took a basic script writing class about how to make your sentences pronounceable. <laughs> Sir, this is a Wendy's. Thank you, Stephen Joyce. Um, so, uh, Buckminster Fuller was an inventor, an economist, um, a philosopher, and a poet. And so this, what, what I am trying to do is one long sentence. Um, honestly, I, I kind of want to diagram that whole sentence. If you remember, um, if you ever had to diagram sentences in like elementary school, uh, where you break it out and it goes on like that little tree where you've got um, like here's the main subject and object and action and uh, uh, it branches off to the this is modifying the object etc. I kind of want to diagram that whole sentence. I think it would be a really fun thing to do and an interesting art piece. Um, but the, to misquote a famous shark hunter, we're gonna need a bigger whiteboard. I missed the third part. Can you read all of it again? Um, the answer is yes, I could. Um, for anyone who <clears throat> is not a regular viewer of the program, I have not seen the things that I show. Uh, typically, I have never seen the things before. Um, I had seen this poster before and I had registered that there was a thing at the bottom written by Buckminster Fuller titled what I am trying to do I had never tried to read it before that was me sight reading it that was me performing it the first time I ever read it uh, so with practice, I could um, I could probably do it much better and make it almost comprehensible. Uh, <clears throat> but there's an introductory phrase that is, I, I think, about that much of it is an introductory phrase. That is the... Um, if, you, if you've ever seen, um, like, formal resolutions, be it resolved that because X, because Y, because Z, or whereas X, whereas Y, whereas Z, whereas double A, etc. Um, this is the whereases. This is the because these circumstances apply, it, it's not until like here that you get to the be it resolved that. Um, and, and that is delineated in the poem with this last line here. On this day of lots of random flowery words, we went to Starbucks for lunch. Hi, Iron Trout. Uh, I hope that your birthday went well. Uh, it was you that had a recent birthday, right? 
I might be misremembering, but also whether your birthday was recent or not, I hope that it went well. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's not until it's the bottom of the fourth column here where you get I seek. So everything before here is the whereas, 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 whereas. I seek is the first be it resolved that. Uh, so that if you want to like understand the purpose as it's being laid out in this format, that's where you start. I seek through compulsively anticipatory design science and its reductions to and its reductions to physical practices in the forms of inanimate objects. So I seek through design science to reform the environment instead of trying to reform human behaviors and opinions. Uh, for I am intent through artifact interventions to accomplish prototyped capabilities of doing ever more with ever less. Uh, <clears throat> And it goes on to explain that um, the whole the whole goal is do more with less while implementing a system where everyone can do what they need to do without that causing detriment to anyone else. Um, it, like the whole goal is use technology to get to the point where we're able to do things basically use technology to create the world of star trek the next generation where we have the technology we need to eliminate scarcity to eliminate need and allow people to pursue their goals to pursue their projects and live their lives to the fullest without negatively affecting anyone else. That is the, the goal as explained in here. Um, which is a lofty goal and well worth pursuing. Um, I just, I think it's really fun the way that he explained it there. And um, I had a lot of fun reading it. I might, because uh, I do want to diagram it. Um, and after I diagram it, I may practice it and then record it. So I will read it again, but I think I will read it as a recording. And so you'll want to watch uh, the Special Collections and University Archives blog because I will look to post the diagram of the sentence along with my uh, subsequent performance of it there. Um, because that seems fun. <laughs> um, above that is this timeline of, um, so you've got U.S. presidents, U.S. vice presidents. I don't really know why they're on here. And why it starts with Cleveland, Grover Cleveland. That I don't understand. Um, <clears throat> but then you get up here, like, I don't understand. <laughs> I mean, it starts with Grover Cleveland because it starts in 1895. Oh, I see. It's because this te demonstrated technical and economic efficacy of individual initiative in the 20th century the timeline is based on Buckminster Fuller's life, which is why it starts in 1895 when Buckminster Fuller was born. Um, Octet Trust Kindergarten, attended Milton Academy, Jellyfish Propulsion Device, uh, that looks to be around 1906. Um, Graduated Milton Academy. 
cotton machinist, attended Harvard University. Uh, I think Harvard was before the cotton machinist. Uh, packing house industry apprentice, transport magazine, ensign to the US Navy, assistant export manager, armor and company, Naval Academy, Annapolis, uh, President Stockade Building System, 240 buildings built, eastern half of U.S. Buckminster Fuller, 30-day cruising in Vincent Astor's learning monoplane flying boat. Dymaxion House, conceived as energetic environment valve with wind-powered ventilation and power. Grand strategy, one town, world Dymaxion philosophy. So it's, it's a timeline of... Primarily Buckminster Fuller's inventions. Um, alongside up here are inventions that I guess are important in the context of world problem solving uh, that were not Buckminster Fuller's, like the year he was born, the wireless telegraph was invented. When did that start with a dramatic mustache? <laughs> no, yeah, no, it's because it's following... Um, Fuller's life. Uh, and then this one is in transportation. Uh, so we've got horse and buggy, bicycle. That's definitely, really? The bicycle wasn't invented until after 1895? Somehow I don't think that's accurate. It doesn't say bicycle, but it's a, it's a picture, an illustration of a person on a bicycle. Um, Heavier than air, wood, and cloth biplane. Noted, uh, 1903. Ford Model T mass production. Um, various other things. First commercial airline. Uh, helicopter. DC-4, DC-6, DC-7. First satellite. Unmanned rocket to the moon. First man in orbit. Photos from Mars. Man on the moon. Etc. Um, so then, I don't, I don't really know why U.S. presidents and vice presidents are mapped along here. And so the top row here only gets you to Ford, but then it there's a dotted line going from Gerald Ford. To 1915, and I don't understand that. <laughs> Why is there a dotted line from 1915 uh, Buckminster Fuller's artifact inventions, technical reproductions to practice? There's just a dotted line from the dot for 1915 going up to Gerald Ford being vice president. I, I don't know why. Did something that Buckminster Fuller did in 1915, does he feel like that, like did he start working to get Ford to the vice presidency in 1915? Because that seems very forward sighted. Anyway. I don't understand everything about this, but I do love the what I am trying to do part at the bottom, and, and we'll have fun with that. Um, I will let people know when um, I have diagrammed the sentence and recorded it and put it on the blog, because that is going to be a ton of fun. Um, I enjoyed reading it this time, and... So I just need to, I just need to practice it. There was at least one word that I stumbled over and it appears twice. Um, how about we dig a little bit into the specifics of what the heck is this world game all about? How do you play? Um... So I've gone to box one and I pulled out the folder titled World Game Report from 1969. Nice. Um, 
Okay. World Game Report. Uh, and we've got a lovely illustration here of the world, but maybe not as you have seen it before. Become rich, stomp all over working class? No! Detective Zen, that's the opposite. Um, but this is the world, but probably not as you've seen it before. And there is Buckminster Fuller. Um, and he appears to be gesturing towards Los Angeles area. If, or maybe... Not Los Angeles, no. I Maybe more like um, San Diego. Because it's further down the coast towards the Baja Peninsula. Um, but that's North America on its side. Which uh, we'll, we'll definitely get to in a second. <clears throat> World Game Report. Summary of project led by R. Buckminster Fuller, Edward Schlossberg, and Daniel Glides Game. Published by the New York Studio School of Painting and Sculpture in association with Good News. Editors Mary Darren, Metterd Gable, Photography Daniel Glides Game, and Herbert Matter. The World Game took place at the New York Studio School of Painting and Sculpture. It lasted from the 12th of June to the 31st of July. The project materials are now at Southern Illinois University, where World Game will be continued. I do not know uh, if it's still Southern Illinois or not. Uh, if you drop the um, Finding Aid link, uh, there's a link to the website, the current active website for the World Game, um, where you can find that information. Um, the project and this publication were made possible by a generous grant from the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Um, what is the date on this? 1969. Uh, we, we knew that going in. Uh, and as you can see, this was used by someone. Um, they made notes, uh, probably Fisaro, um, in preparing some sort of presentation, I'm guessing, because the bracket saying slide. Um, <clears throat> world Game. The World Game is a scientific means for discovering the expeditious ways of employing the world's resources so efficiently and omniconsiderately as to be able to provide a higher standard of living for all of humanity, higher than has heretofore been experienced by any humans and on a continually sustainable basis, while enabling all of humanity to enjoy the whole planet Earth without any individual profiting at the expense of another, and without interference with one another, while arresting pollutions and conserving the wild resources and antiquities. The world game discards the Malthusian doctrine, which is the present working assumption of the major states which holds that humanity is multiplying much more rapidly than it can supply resources to itself and compounds Darwin's survival of the fittest to assume that only the side with the greatest arms can survive. The world game, an assimilated logistical operation for 40 years, has already demonstrated beyond question that the Malthusian doctrine is fallacious and that committing all the high technology resources now going into the world's annual $150 billion war-making facilities, all of humanity can be brought to economic success within one quarter century, thus eliminating the fundamental raison d'etre of war. The world game employs the general system, logistics for the reorganized use of the world's resources and employs comprehensive and progressive series of waves of producing in higher performance per units of invested time, energy, and know-how in each and every component function of the overall scheduling. The world game makes it possible for intelligent amateurs to discover within a few weeks of research and interest that the foregoing 
just like solve all of humanity's problems theoretically <clears throat> all right let's see we worked with the students in mind we worked to develop a research and design team to effectively deal with the data and concepts necessary to play world game the students came from physics biology art architecture anthropology new york san francisco miami oskaloosa they ranged from 19 to 46 years of age. The first four weeks of the semester were devoted to input. Mr. Fuller thought aloud about his ideas, concepts, inventions, and discoveries. The students did individual research into trends, energy sources, and many other information areas. They were constructing a base on which to develop ideas about the whole Earth. We saw films, read extensively, and traveled through the minds of the others in the room. We watched as man successfully stood on another body in space and could see the Earth as a spaceship. Uh, referencing the moon landing, um, which date appropriate for when they were doing this, honestly. Did the stream just end? What happened? Um... Wow. I think it's live again, but it dropped. It died. It did. I don't I don't even know how long it was down. I just I looked up and it said zero viewers and I was like, "What?" Because <laughs> I usually can see that I have at least viewers. Um, but I looked up and it was like zero. And then I, I went and checked and it was like, you've been on for 45 seconds. Uh, so yeah, it dropped out entirely. Signal seemed uninterrupted there. But you've been getting, been getting a lot of lag. And the timer reset. Yeah. No, it, it the stream went offline and then came back. So I, I don't know what happened. And I I don't know how long it was off. But um What was the last thing y'all saw? Did you see me start like reading the introduction here? Or Or did you hear me start reading the introduction? I don't know. Um, uh, this is the part that's this started with. We worked with the students in mind. Uh, and talked about um, physics. By uh, the students were from physics, biology, art, architecture, anthropology, New York, San Francisco, Miami, and Oskaloosa, um, uh, ranging from nineteen to forty-six years of age. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know where I was, but um, hopefully we didn't lose too much. Um, I lost where I was. Uh, Watch the man successfully. Yes, they watched the moon landing. The students were working to make visible the coordination of that spaceship, that spaceship Earth, um, in order to accelerate the trend toward physical success for all humanity. Each day, the growth of the students and the growth of world game was extraordinary. Without fear, without competition, the students worked together to realize world game as fully as they could. The last three weeks were intense with research and organization on how to display the findings that were being made. There was no duplication, no repetition, and the energy and information grew visibly before us. We were working at the frontier and each student was, uh, and each student was working at his frontier their frontier. Uh, it is dramatic to see human beings so concerned with the operation and the well-being of the Earth. 
Mr. Fuller said at the start of the project that it was the most important work to be done. This document and the strength with which the students left the project are evidence. We will all be involved in world game as the students were. On the last day of the project, there was a lunch gathering. Mr. Fuller said that he would miss their faces, but would see them continually. As the students left, there were few goodbyes. The project will continue. Uh, Edwin Schlossberg. Um, so, let's find out what we can learn. Okay, so, um, so this is the World Game Report, which is going to give us some information about the game itself, it looks like. So, first, pre-scenario facts. Our pre-scenario facts consist of the conceptual tools which we found ourselves using most often in our dealings with the whole Earth. They are by no means even an attempt at being complete, but are merely a general frame of reference for us as individual participants to fit our respective specializations into. To a large extent, the specifics of the world game course left with its participants. What is here is the general base we started with and evolved, uh, evolved through as our individual understanding and refinement grew. Uh, Okay, so they had world population growth chart divided up by continent. Well, not just by continent. Okay, it has total, the world. Then it has Asia, Europe, Africa, the USSR, North America, Latin America, and Oceania. What? Is anybody else as confused by that as I am? The USSR is part of Asia. Why is the USSR listed separately from Asia? I assume Latin America is Central and South America. But why is the USSR separated from Asia? I'm confused. Or is it because the USSR covered, spanned part of Europe and part of Asia? Like it was on both continents, so it was listed separately because it spanned the two continents? Because racism, probably, key squared. <laughs> That's just, it's just odd that to me, I, that. Um, okay, so let's see. We've got how much electrical energy is in the human mind? On what does man's regeneration depend? How many synapses and miles of neurons does the human brain possess? What's a toy? What's the chemical result of frustration in the human body? What is the minimum caloric intake necessary to develop hydroelectric sources? What is the best working efficiency for the human body? What does man's physical efficiency compare, or how does man's physical efficiency compare with his mental efficiency? Is brain power a measurable energy source? And how can it be measured? Uh, these questions seem super familiar to me. Again, from uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars trilogy, um, because in it, in the trilogy, um, spoilers, uh, Mars develops an economy based on the kilocalorie, um, where items are valued by the effort required to produce them um, and uh, essentially the effort you put into something is all calculated out and so 
doing X thing earns you X amount of like kilocalories because that's how much you expended energy wise and allows you, their whole economy ends up being kilocalorie based. Uh, and in order to do the calculations that were used to generate that economy in the Mars trilogy by Kim, Kim Stanley Robinson, these are the types of questions that they needed values for. Like, an hour of thought. Like, thinking about a problem to come up with a solution. How much energy does that burn, and therefore, what should it be valued at? Um, so, that sort of energy calculation uh, is useful in that sort of sense. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh! Wait, the captioner's not on? Did the captioner shut off? Um, it did. So I'm I'm confused because I the captioner was on. But one I know that my stream is not the first one that has had an interruption today. Um, so I don't know if the problem is at Twitch or local internet or what, but uh, whatever. Um, the captions should be on now. Um, thank you to Stream Closed Captioner bot for telling me. Yeah, no, I, it, it, Hannah, I'm just confused because um, I have a captioner, I have the same captioner on for both channels, um, but for reasons of technology and what a computer will let you do, uh, it has to run on two separate machines in order to route to both channels um, because I can't capture the microphone and split it to two different places. Um, and so one of the captioners went down and the other one didn't. And then I, so then I thought, well, maybe only one of my computers lost its internet, but the computer that actually initiated the streams the captioner kept going, but the streams both went down. So I don't know what's going on. Anyway, uh, external metabolics, access to medical attention, access to information, education, com communication, waste disposable, recreation, and ecological sweep out. Migration and transportation. I This is a new term to me, ecological sweep out. What are some of the present trends in man's relation to his environment in relation to, in, in, in relation to man? Uh, on what prime conditions has man's survival so far depended? If one knows more about food and the body, does it automatically mean that, that uh, they eat better? What relationship is man now affecting with their universe? Are internal problems of communications the same as external problems of communications. Uh, so these are all like sort of philosophical, conceptual questions, but these are the problems inherent in a lot of the tension and strife in the world. These are the what, what they identified as the underlying issues, the questions that needed to be answered be, so that they could come up with solutions so that everybody could live well without negatively affecting someone else. Um, mankind has universe, the aggregate of all humanities, all time, consciously apprehended and communicated experience. Galactic clusters, Milky Way, what kinds of knowledge have space experiments made available to man? Uh, and what are the implications of this knowledge for man's future? Stars. And then our star system, Sun, Pluto, Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Venus, Moon, our satellites, and Earth. Total surface area, total water.
what are the areas of agricultural production located and what size? So wanting to know where is the agricultural production, how much of the Earth's surface it took up, amount of solar energy reaching the surface. Can we ever really be exact about anything? <laughs> Wind speeds. Would war be eliminated if resources were as spontaneously available as air is? Think about that. That seems like an excellent question. Would there be war if you could get food and water and like all of your basic necessities as easily as you can breathe air? Um, how much electrical power is needed to produce a ton of F-pod? Okay, now I need to know what F-pod is. Oh, food. It's, that's... It's food, not F-pod. So how much electricity is needed to make a ton of food? Present protein distribution per capita throughout the world. Calories used in different activities per hour. Laying in bed for an hour, 77 calories. Sleeping for an hour, 65 calories. Sitting at rest for an hour, 100 calories. Walking slowly, 200 calories. Standing, 105 calories. Working, uh, doing, looks like, Carpentry or like not like artist on canvas painting, but like wall painting, I'm guessing, since it's there with carpenting. Um, 240 calories. Running, 570 calories. Swimming, 500 calories. Walking upstairs, 1100 calories. Um, what is the effect of interruption on human thought? And that question is not, like, that question is not just, like, what is the effect on the individual, but what is the broad effect on the world of someone's thoughts being interrupted? So... Uh, they're talking about what is the electrical, like what is the numerical value of the electricity in the brain? So the, the, how many calories does it burn to sit and think for an hour? Like to work on a problem, like they're trying to value thought the way that we value commodities as part of thinking through problem solving. So this, what is the effect of interruption on human thought? That is just like a, a much broader question than it sounds like. Like if you interrupt somebody's thinking and they're not able to finish a thought that would have led to a solution and they're not able to come back to it right away, how much additional effort has to be spent globally because that thought was interrupted? That's a really interesting question. Like somebody's in it on the verge of coming up with the replicator from Star Trek. They're on the verge of inventing a replicator. 
and their thoughts get interrupted. What is the effect overall of that thought being interrupted? How much energy does it cost the human race because their thought was interrupted and they didn't invent the replicator for another year all because their thought was interrupted what a con what a what a question of oh, hi 16 bit eric hello whimsies welcome uh we are solving the world's problems Theoretically, um, welcome to Archival Adventures. I'm Anthony Wright de Hernandez, the Community Collections Archivist at Virginia Tech, um, also known on the internet as Rogan27. We today are exploring materials about R. Buckminster Fuller, um, whom you may have heard of as the inventor of the geodesic dome and the buckyball. Um, in the 19, uh, late 1960s and early 1970s, he came up with the world game which it's kind of like a thought experiment to look at problems global problems from a global perspective instead of from an individual uh national or regional perspective and um to see if answers to how to solve the problems uh, could be found by taking a whole uh, human race perspective rather than breaking it up into tribal or uh, bordered considerations. Uh, so that is what we're looking at today. Um, it is great to have you joining. Um, hello, uh, uh, CJ. Um, thank you for the, the for dropping in and saying hi. Hi, uh, Lady Helser and Blue Rooster and everybody. Now I've done it. I talked about Star Trek and the Whimsies showed up. I know. If anybody was here who doesn't already follow 16-Bit Eric, if you were finding my discussion of Buckminster Fuller interesting, you should be following 16-Bit Eric. 16-Bit uh, Eric is a wonderful, wonderful storyteller. Um, who has a particular expertise for um, telling stories within the Star Trek universe. Um, and the Whimsies are a wonderful community that are well worth a follow. Um, oh gosh, is it? No, it's not almost time to go play more games. Hi, Obi-Wan. Uh, let me, there's more stuff to look at. Um, we need to talk about the Mercator project. The Mercator projection. That's what we need to talk about before we're before we're done. Uh, so anyway, this this book booklet is uh, sort of describing what the first world game was all about, and we were we were looking at some of the questions that they were. Uh, at when you came in, we were looking at some of the questions that they were. Um, considering as part of the pre-game information. Um, and we had just come across a question that was, what is the cost of interrupting human thought? And I was trying to think of, like trying to explain that that question is much more broad than just, um, uh, you know, how much does it cost somebody because their thought got interrupted? It's, it's, don't think of it uh, from the individual level. Think of it from a global perspective. So um, that person whose thought was interrupted was on the way to inventing a replicator. And they their thought gets interrupted. What does that mean? Like, what is the cost of that? How, long, how much longer does it take to invent the replicator uh, since their thought got interrupted? How much energy, how much human energy and effort um, gets spent unnecessarily because that thought was interrupted? 
not just the energy expended to return to that thought process and finish it, but all of the energy of everyone who was producing products that would not need to be produced because the replicator would have been invented. Like, it's that kind of global thinking, that kind of considering problems uh, that the world game was focused on and is focused on. And it's a fascinating, really, really interesting perspective. Um, sorry, this folder is just called Ephemera, and, and I wasn't sure what was in it, and I opened it up uh, because, you know, I typically don't know what anything is, but this folder is just called Ephemera, and uh, this appears to be a holiday card that somebody made, um, where all it says is, strange is truther than fiction. Signed, Don, Fas Don Fasaro, 1976. The Basilisk Problem? But 1960? What is the Basilisk Problem? The Basilisk Problem. I, I'm unfamiliar. Um, and now I'm really curious. Uh, Roko's Basilisk is a thought experiment which states that an otherwise benevolent artificial superintelligence AI in the future would be incentivized to create a virtual reality simulation to torture anyone who knew of its potential existence but did not directly contribute to its advancement or development in order to incentivize said advancement. It originated in a 2010 post at a discussion board Less Wrong, a technical forum focused on analytical rational inquiry. The thought experiment's name derives from the poster of the article... Roko and the Basilisk, a mythical creature capable of destroying enemies with its stare. Interesting. Info hazards, generally. Okay. No, it's um I had not heard of the the, the Basilisk problem and, and I'm now quite fascinated. Um I don't I, I want to know more, but we're technically already out of time, and I'm so I'm not going to try to figure out what the ephemera is. But I want to know more. It, it was pretty. I'm not sure what it was, but I, I can't believe I ran out of time. Of course I ran out of time. I always run out of time on this show. There's always more uh, to see than can ever be seen, more to do than... Can ever be done. Um, steps to world game. Development of a computer assisted world energy scenario as a prototype world game operation. 1974. Developed and written for the Design Science Institute by Michael Ben Eli. Huh. Leans heavily on. on Mr. Fuller's work. Preface. Preface. That's good. This document is submitted by the Design Science Institute. Uh, zoom in. As it seeks funds for developing a first step in the gradual implementation of R. Buckminster Fuller's world game concept. Uh, it is written to provide a broad introduction to the world game and to describe a specific project that the Design Science Institute proposes to undertake in collaboration, blah, 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 blah. Um, six major sections. Introduce Buckminster Fuller, the Design Science Institute, and the University City Science Center, as well as the project that the Design Science Institute proposes to develop. Uh, conceptual background, a system overview. <clears throat> Brief introduction to design science. Um, chosen immediate goal of developing a computer-assisted world energy scenario. Spells out the organizational details of the proposed project. Identifies the organization structure and composition. Uh, okay. It would be interesting to dig into that, but again, 
don't have the time. So what I want to do is I want to look specifically at um, one element, which is uh, maps. Because we've 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 seen some interesting things already. Um, I want to look at the map. I feel like your featured ding command should be for the song lyrics instead of innuendo. Oh, it should be for song lyrics instead. Probably because I do song lyrics all the time. Um, what song lyrics did I just do? I believe you that I did. I just, I do them unconsciously so that I don't even know what song lyrics I did. <laughs> Circle of life, okay. Yes, I did. Um, wow. I, I, I totally did it like completely unconsciously. Um, Okay, Earth Metabolic Design. I think this will give uh, what I want. So as you can see, that is not the Mercator projection. That is not how we typically see the world. Does everybody know what the Mercator projection is? Um, I can throw it up. Uh... Uh, the Mercator projection is a cylindrical map projection presented by Flemish geographer and cartographer Gerardus Mercator in 1569. And it became the standard map projection for navigation because it's unique in representing north as up and south as down everywhere while preserving local directions and shapes. As a side effect, uh, it inflates the size of objects away from the equator. This inflation is very small near the equator, but accelerates with increasing latitude to become infinite at the poles. As a result, land masses such as Greenland, Antarctica, Canada, and Russia appear far larger than they actually are relative to land masses near the equator, such as Central Africa. So this is the map that most people in Western cultures have known as the world for your entire life. But it is not accurate as a way of conceptualizing and viewing the actual sizes of the land masses in comparison to one another. This map was intended as an aid for navigation and is useful in that context, but it is not useful when you're trying to look at issues of equity and equality and trying to tie those to geography and amount of space that each country takes. So this is the Mercator projection. It is not the only way a map can be displayed. And it is not always the most useful way that a map can be displayed. Earth metabolic design. This is um, relying on a different map projection. You can see uh, in, in here, we've got Africa. We've got, um, this is the Arabian Peninsula, um, Europe, there's Britain, there's Asia, here's Australia, uh, there's Greenland, there's North America, Central America, South America, and Antarctica. And as you can see, Greenland, Africa. Greenland is much smaller than Africa. 
So, um, but it, but if you look at Mercator, Greenland is bigger than Africa. Given given the Mercator projection, um, it, because as you, like Greenland is is that that whole white bit there that is Greenland, and it's bigger than Africa, given the Mercator projection. But this is more realistic and a better vi visualization of the actual sizes of the land masses. Um, and you can see Greenland is much smaller than Africa. <laughs> so, the concept. The Earth is presently faced with an accelerating frequency of crises. And unless we make major changes in the way we solve our problems, this trend will continue. Since the Earth cannot indefinitely sustain our present careless approach to problems, the future of life on this planet depends on the way we respond to our present predicament. Humanity is being forced to confront the choice between survival and future evolution, or extinction as a species. If we are to choose survival, we must act consciously to participate in the design of our own evolution. The belief that we can successfully design simulate, stimulated the formation of Earth metabolic design. A corporation organized to undertake projects to help ensure the continued survival of humanity. Its activities are directed toward the application of what R. Buckminster Fuller has called Comprehensive Anticipatory Design Science. Uh, CADS. Uh, <laughs> this approach involves recognizing that our problems are all interrelated and cannot be solved separately. Successful design will come from the integration of all of our knowledge about ourselves and our environment to permit the most intelligent possible employment of our resources to meet our needs. Quote, the world can be designed to work for 100% of humanity at higher standards of living than present without any individual profiting at the expense of another. Unquote. Our, Bu our Buckminster Fuller. Um, so... I want sadly this this document doesn't go into why why this map and I don't have that at the moment I don't remember exactly where that is in here and uh, we are over time by almost 15 minutes so I'm not gonna be able to get to it um, I'm definitely doing a blog post in future related to this material um, so I will definitely link that in the description for the VOD, um, as well as uh, make sure that I include something about the map itself um, in the blog post. Uh, but um, for anybody who joined later, earlier in the stream, I sight read a thing. I sight read this sentence, this single sentence. This is a sentence. This sentence is Buckminster Fuller's poem explaining what his goal was with the world game, like what he hoped to achieve. And I read it from beginning to end, sight reading it. <clears throat> and so what I'm going to do after stream, uh, not today, but what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to diagram this sentence and I'm going to record it, record me reading it. Um, and those will be part of a blog post that I put on the um, Special Collections and University Archives blog in future. Um, I will link that blog post once it is up in the VOD for today's episode. Um, I find this, all of this, I the, the whole philosophy, the world game concept of trying to solve problems uh, globally rather than tribally or nationally or 
and and the the sort of thought that is required to think globally about problems such as uh, food, energy, housing, etc. Um, I find really fascinating. I really enjoy that. That's it. Really gets me engaged and gets me excited and, and going. Um, and so I, I'm happy that I got a chance to look at this on stream today. I'm happy that um, I found something so so fun uh, as this really long sentence uh, to um, so, sort of play with. And uh, I'm going to diagram it as an art piece. Uh, throw that on the blog and then um, record it because I, I did a fairly good job I think of, of reading it, sight reading it on stream um, but it can be made more comprehensible uh, if I practice a little bit before uh, reading it again um, anyway I, I do sadly have to end because um, I have to take down some stuff and and head home um i think uh we saw one of our wonderful um favorite streamer friends in chat earlier so i think we're gonna raid stephen joys uh who is currently playing a game called jusant um that I have seen a little bit of, um, and it is very much, it does an excellent job of um, illustrating rock climbing, like actual rock climbing. Uh, so have fun with that. Um, Stephen Joy's, uh, Stephen's community is a, is a wonderful community. Um, they are uh, a quite lovely, very inviting place. Um, there are a number of librarians in that community. Um, I happen to know. But, uh, yeah. Hopefully you will join me there. Um, next week on Archival Adventures, uh, I do have an episode. Don't I? No, next week I do not have an episode. Um, there is no episode of Archival Adventures next week because campus closes at noon on Wednesday uh, for the Thanksgiving holiday in the United States. So I won't have access to any of the collections and I will be uh, not paid during that time. So no episode next week. Um, come back in two weeks for the next in our high energy physics series. Um, I think we're revisiting the collection where I didn't have time to get to Interstellar Flight and looking at Interstellar Flight. So I hope to see you then. Um, and yeah, thank you all so much for joining me. Uh, I hope that this was fun for you. It was certainly fun for me. Hopefully I see you again soon and um, keep exploring history.